Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, I can see there's a, a good number of people in here, so it's great to see so many of you with us today. I'm just going to do a very brief introduction, um, keep this as, as quick as possible, um, just to let you know a couple of things about the session. So in terms of what to expect today, that we're going to look at a combination of things. We're going to look at the, roll, the rollout plan for side 2.0, the best ways to approach it, some strategies you can implement. Um, we're also going to take some time to look at the human element, human factors approach, and the role of training in improving shipboard performance. If you have any questions during the session, please use the chat function um, on the right-hand side. We'll address questions at the end of the session. I'll take them in chronological order. If we don't get time to answer everybody's question, then we will reach out to you after the webinar with an answer to your question. Um, just one thing left from me is in the bottom right hand corner of your screen, you see a little square. If you click that to enter full screen mode, um, the presenter's presentations will appear a bigger on your screen. So without any further ado, I will hand over to our first speaker. Grant, and over to you. Well, good morning. Thank you, James. Good morning, everybody. Um, or good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, my name is Franz Ubex. I'm working for Intertanko, the Secretariat in, in London. I'm Belgian national. Um, now more than five years with, with Intertanko. Um, very short for those who do not know what Indotanko is about. Uh, Indotanko is an association of independent tanker owners um, leading uh, the continuous improvement of the tanker industry. Um, goals are zero fatalities, zero pollutions, zero detentions. So we try to help our members to deliver highest quality services. Um, very short, uh, short of uh, all, almost 4,000 tankers in the pool, um, about 180 full members. Um, but we um, tr are trying to do or, or, or are uh, doing for our members is first of all being a forum, a forum where members meet, share uh, information, best practices. We're also an advisor providing guidance on, on all kind of issues which affect our members' interests and uh, championing, uh, so speaking and acting uh, for the in independent tanker owners. Um, this very general, uh, but I am I am secretary of the vetting committee uh, of Intertanko and uh, I'll highlight a bit what the vetting committee is about, what we are doing, etc. So, um, our activities, uh, obviously SIA 2, uh, very high on the agenda. Um, we do have regular meetings with the All Majors Forum on behalf of our uh, members, um, trying to have a very open discussion with them. Uh, organizing vetting forums, organizing uh, seafarers vetting seminars. We had uh, two weeks ago a uh, very interesting vetting seminar in, in Manila for the seafarers, uh, almost 1,300 uh, seafarers in the room. Here again, talking about SIA 2, how to prepare. Um, working groups in the vetting committee, um, working on the Guide to the Vetting Process, um, well-known book of Intertanko, um, where we guide uh, at the industry what are the requests and and the expectations of the oil majors, also port state control, etc. We have benchmarking tools. I will show that uh, very shortly. Uh, we are working uh, working group on remote inspections, um, the MSA working group. So these are all uh, issues which affect members and uh, where we try to work together with the industry. Also other. Uh, others on the agenda, uh, right chip, CDI, Porsche control, MOUs, and, and the IMO. Um, 
Like I said, benchmarking tools on our website, members can benchmark against uh, others using the tools. Um, there is the TMSA, uh, there's the LTI uh, benchmarking tools. Very simple tools actually, uh, where you can see where you as a company stand against others uh, using, using this system. Um, also very popular, the LTIs, uh, vessel, policy control and vetting feedback forms. If you have issues with policy control inspector, inspectors, with vetting inspectors, you can uh, uh, report that to Intertanko and uh, we'll take that up with uh, local administrations and uh, eventually with OKIM, CDI and other inspection regimes. Now, SIA 2, um, cooperation was key. Uh, remember the Mac 4 when that came onto the, uh, onto the industry was like, uh, when is that applicable? Now it's applicable immediately. Um, so the whole industry had to look into it, how to prepare, etc. cetera. Um, since a couple of years, um, this is, not the case anymore in the industry we realize everybody realizes that if you launch such new ideas new documentations new guidance um, you have to buy in the whole industry so we are working on on a lot of uh, issues together with Okim uh, be it on security we have joint meetings with them um, our XCOM uh, met uh, this year actually in May um, they sat together, um, thinking of what, where can we work further together on uh, on issues which are relevant to to the industry. Uh, IMO submissions, uh, for example, are exchanged with each other before submitting them to IMO and seeing if we can support each other. We have the safety initiative, where members of OKIM and members of uh, Intertango. Uh, come together, develop the BCAF, for example, the tanker accident database. Um, this one is discontinued for the time being. Still working on incident investigation methodologies. Uh, human factors, uh, the future element of TMSA. I can already um, tell you that the TMSA will not be reviewed for the time being. TMSA 3 is still valid and remains valid for uh, quite some uh, time. Um, there is technical cooperations on the engine power limit, uh, onshore power limit, um, onshore power uh, system, sorry. Um, so just to demonstrate that um, we are not working in silos, but working together also with SECTO, with CDI, with ICS, with the EU, for example, on, uh, on other um, on, on certain specific issues uh, in Europe. Now, for the SIA 2, the uh, topic of the day. What uh, Okim recognized is that uh, we need the industry um, to work together on the SIA 2 project. We had a question library, which was uh, uh, delivered to, you know, the 1,394 pages, which was delivered quite early to Intertanko, um, to review it, to give our input, to look if all was accurate, uh, what was uh, mentioned over there. We had workshops with the vetting committee. Um, there is the transition uh, phases, which you are probably well aware, where we work together, where we but uh, our members participate and exchange ideas. Um, we are looking at future integration of IT systems. The idea here is to, you might uh, be aware that all the input, what you have to do with the pre-inspection questionnaire, uh, DHVPQ, it's all manual entry uh, from your desks. And uh, all this information is already electronically available somewhere be it at, at classification societies, be it at uh, Q88, be it at your own IT system, why not uh, get a sort of uh, 
uh, automatic uh, upload to the Yoakim system. So we are working uh, on that one. And then uh, last but not least, we had years ago regular meetings with members uh, specifically on vetting of the um, of OKIF members, but also uh, Intertanko members. So coming together twice a year and discuss the whole sire, um, where is it going, how is it going. Uh, so they called it uh, the sire focus group and still working on that one to re-establish, let's say. So, SIRE 2, we have to understand why. Uh, why is the uh, SIRE 2 not simply called VIQ8 or something like that? Um, it is a complete change of mindset. It's a game changer, what we are looking at. Um, and the reasons are listed over here. Um, it, the VIQ7 contains too much of questions, that's clear. Um, the inspector coming on board, having eight to 10 hours uh, to go through 200 and questions. Yes, no, not applicable. Uh, no time to really inspect the areas uh, on board the ship. I remember when I was still working for an operator, my advice to the master was always when the sire inspector came on board, keep him as long as possible in the captain's office. Then he uh, gave him a lot of food, um, put all your papers over there, and he will spend a lot of time in checking paperwork um, and not too much of time uh, going physically on deck, physically in the engine room uh, to check uh, in detail over there. Um, this will not be possible anymore. Uh, due to the uh, the preload of the uh, the pre-inspection questionnaires and the photographs, etc., so um, was not really risk-based. Um, the VIQ seven, where the SIA two point will be, of course, uh, risk-based. Now um, you all know that the human element uh, of the human factor, how they call it, is going to be very important. Um, during the uh, the SIA 2 inspections, uh, I'm sure uh, we will come back to that uh, in a short uh, d during these uh, the sessions of, uh, today. So, um, for those who are not aware yet, uh, but you should already, there's the core questions. Core questions, 90 questions, not more. Yeah, it is not that. Uh, uh, it is uh, a, a massive amount of, of questions. Um, the core questions, the reason they are called questions, uh, core questions is where OKIMF or OKIMF members uh, thought that these questions are so important. Uh, if they are not uh, answered yes or, or um, uh, the inspector is not satisfied with the answer, uh, that can lead to a catastrophic <laughs> event. Then you have the rotational ones, the rotational two questions, um, all um, uh, an algorithm uh, which will calculate how often they come back. The conditional questions, uh, depending on the history of the ship, the operator, and then the campaign questions, there are non-campaign questions now yet but the idea is a bit like the CIC of the policy control administrations, uh, which you're all aware of. Um, so they will, uh, they will definitely be core questions at that time. Um, focus on the human element, uh, very simple. Um, talking to crew, trying to explain uh, or trying to understand if the crew knows why they are doing a certain job, how they are doing it, where they can find um, the procedures, the policy of the company, the checklist, etc. cetera. Um, pro procedural uh, element, good. Uh, the inspector will, will ask to view certain documents, to view the checklist, to view the procedures, and then hardware uh, if everything is working fine on board. Where are we now, the rollout? We are in phase two since July. 
uh, June, July, June, July, two, which means that a restricted amount of operators and all majors are um, going through uh, a testing phase. Yeah. It seems to go quite well, phase two. Um, we don't know yet when phase two will be finished. Orkin has said that phase, uh, the start of phase three, where everybody will be able to subscribe or, or to um, invite an inspector or an all major to do a Zaya 2 uh, inspection uh, will be possible. They will um, inform us well in time. So uh, watch the space, watch the OKIMF website, watch the Intertanko website, where we will um, inform you when the phase two is up and running and that you can uh, take part for those who are not taking part yet. Um, what is Intertanko doing more? We are working on the Seafarers Practical Guide. So the 1,300 pages, um, we thought like what is it not really practical, um, where, where do you start your junior officer coming on board of a ship, which has maybe to go through a SIR2 inspection in the future, where do I start? Um, start with the Seafarers Practical Guide will be available next month, yeah, um, where you can identify very easily the core questions, um, the rotational questions, where you can identify if the question is related to human factor, to the uh, hardware, to the process. Um, and it, we try to make it very visual and very um uh you, you can see it on the on the slide here um very practical to see okay this is what i have to know this is where it's going about it is in no way uh the idea to replace the uh question library of okinf but uh at least uh easy to find um the questions and the advices in there what finally, what is the advice what we give to members? Well, um, if you have not done yet, review your TMSA submission uh, because every question in the SIA 2 is related to a TMSA uh, element. Um, once phase three is up and running, do participate in phase three. Um, you will not have the chance to do every ship in phase three uh, transition. Uh, inspections, but try to do at, le at least uh, each type of your, sh uh, your ship type, what you have in your fleet. Um, identify the PIQ questions already, um, which are static and dynamic. Um, start to prepare your photos. Um, if you have a uh, rescue boat drill or a live boat drill, uh, give a camera or a smartphone with a uh, with the guys and uh, they can already start to make pictures of the hull, etc. And then raise awareness, of course, amongst the crew, train them. Um, this is a, a brilliant opportunity given by OTG here um, to, to, to raise the awareness, to make sure that people know what is coming. Um, SIA 2 inspection, it's your crew's moment to shine. Yeah. Uh, look at it positive. Um, an inspector will ask uh, somebody on board how he does his job, why he does a job like it is. It is the crew member's moment that he can show off, show off what, how good he is and how good your company is uh, treating them, how good um, the crew is, uh, is, is performing and operating the ship. The very last part, the very difficult part, is the charters, the brokers, the terminals, other stakeholders. We need to get these people on board um, to understand uh, what is society about. Um, they should stop uh, counting the number of observations. Um, they could, they should start to understand what society is about. That it's not just uh, counting. Um, negative observation, but there's much more data which will be available from the industry. And that's it from my end. Over to you, James. 
thank you for that, Frank. Much appreciated. I'm going to hand over the mic now to Andy Usedown. Um, Andy will introduce himself for a moment and then take us through a look at um, the impact that training can have in removing the fear factor. So, Andy, over to you. Yes, thanks very much. And um, hello, everybody. Thanks for joining the webinar session today. Uh, for those of you who haven't met me before, I'm Andy Eastown. Um, I'm a naval architect, marine engineer, currently working for ocean technology as a subject matter expert. Can't quite believe it, but I'm in my 48th year in the maritime industry. Um, previously, I've worked with Lloyd's Register uh, as a surveyor, as a regional manager, and as a global marine training manager, and with Shell, where I was the learning and development advisor to shipping and, and maritime. Uh, I've got a background in um, ship design, construction and operation, but the last 22 years of my career really have been in learning and development. Um, as I mentioned, I, I provide subject matter experts, expertise to, to Ocean on a range of uh, technical subjects, but also uh, I'm the author of the SIA 2.0 Human Factors module. And um, one of the main jobs that I do is I look forward at the legislation, the regulations that are changing, are coming through the, to the industry that will impact the industry. I put those into a report for ocean technology so that we can prepare in advance and make sure that the um, the, the training that you need is, is, is ready in good time. So as an example of that, the SAR 2.0 modules have been available for a, about a year now, um, although in our favor, the rollout has been slightly delayed. So, um, but yes, we, we're always looking ahead, always trying to make sure that the information that the um, industry needs is, is available and that we're doing our best to support you and uh, help you through these changes. So um, I've called my <laughs> presentation Removing the Fear Factor. I think um, it's still quite clear from the feedback that we get from, from various sessions that people are very worried um, about what's coming with SAR 2.0, but it was encouraging to hear what Franz was saying there um, about this is your chance to shine, this is your chance to uh, demonstrate just how good you are, um, because that's the approach that we like to take as well, a positive approach, and the training will help. And so um, we'll have a little look now and uh, and see what um, how the training improves things. So. The, the idea really of the training that's provided is to try and help dispel the myths around the subject, help learners to understand what human factors really means. I'm not expecting people to be experts in human factors. Um, so we try to put it into practical terms for them. And the thing to remember is, is that the SIR inspector doesn't really have time during his inspection um, to carry out a full behavioral competency, competency assessment of, of individuals. So and again, although they've received training, they're not human factors um, experts. So they've got a very clearly defined set of criteria that they use. And you may well have heard by now of the performance influencing factors. So this is very clearly defined um, set of uh, topics which um, the uh, inspector will use to guide him so that by the end of the um, inspection, He's got something objective that he can write in his uh, in his report. And the the ocean training module provides a very clear explanation of that. And it also shows the way that the crew can um, respond to the inspector's questions in a way that gives the best overall impression and the best um, outcome to the inspection. We use case studies and they provide realistic examples. I mean, people will actually recognize the situation that they find themselves in. They will see um, what's in the training material and they'll think, oh yes, that, that applies to me. But one of the main things that we have is um, a recommendation within the training modules for shipboard officers to hold uh, regular training sessions with the crew to clarify the new requirements. There shouldn't be any surprises. And um, I'm gonna speak about that a little bit more later on. So um, you might be aware as well that there are um, a number of uh, videos and um, papers and so on uh, out on the internet, mainly from Ockinf, um, which um, uh, call themselves uh, training materials. Um, I, I would prefer 
to uh, without in any way um, being rude to or can call them helpful information um, because there's a huge difference between um, training materials and what I would call helpful information then this is really um, the way that which the, the materials are designed and the fact that they are set with um, clear objectives and assessed during the process so um, all of the ITG training material is designed with very clear objectives it's assessed during um, during the, the um, training session to make sure that people are our understanding. And then there's a final assessment at the end, which confirms that learning has actually been achieved. And um, through, through that process, uh, it's possible for a company to provide clear evidence of learning. They, they know they can record the fact that the people have actually completed the training and they also can have a, a, a way of showing that Yes, they've actually understood, um, you know, this is uh, information which that which they hold, which when you when you look at the helpful information, yes, you can you can achieve a lot with that. But there's no way to record that. You don't really know what's been taken in. You're not quite sure um, who's done it and when they did it and whether actually they even learned anything while they were doing it. So I think the other really important factor as well and this is where helpful information is is useful too, um, is that by going through this kind of training process, everybody learns a common vocabulary. Um, so whether they're on board, whether they're in the office, they achieve a sort of common understanding of what is the topic, what are they talking about, and they, they'll understand their role in achieving a successful inspection. So looking at our own figures, um, we can only look at our own uh, subscribed members, of course, but um, there's two charts here. The one on the left is showing um, the SIA 2.0 programs, all of them, and the one on the right is showing the human factors. And so what we can see is that um, whilst there's been a very um, gratifying take up and more than 43,000 people have um, carried out some training um, there's still a long way to go, um, even even on the um, tankers uh, side of things, still less than 50% of the eligible crew members have actually um, done any undertaken any training. And if we look at human factors, we can see that it's even a much smaller uh, proportion. So um, obviously we would commend people to um, start this training as, as soon as they can and to uh, to promote it to their to their staff so that it does to help help to dispel this this concern this worry um, that people have so also as a matter of interest the difference between the dark blue and the light blue is a, where the um, the ship has actually got the programs installed but they nobody's actually tackled them yet so again perhaps a little reminder to everybody that you've got this material, you've, you can actually do this training now and um, encourage them to, to progress it and uh, get on with it. So the real issue, removing the fear factor, um, what, uh, what are the practical measures that we can, we can use to help people to, to explain the, the process that will be used? And um, we try to do that as much as possible through case studies, as I mentioned before, um, it looks familiar to you. It looks like something that you do. You can relate to it and it can really help you. And then the other aspect of it is, is if um, one of the things we particularly strongly advise is that uh, don't leave this um, situation where the first time that the person who, who you know, Franz mentioned there, the inspector will talk to the crew, he will ask questions. So don't let the inspection be the first time that that person answers that question because they won't give their best performance. And if we think about how do people produce their best performance, they do it by practicing, they do it by preparing. Um, in in theatre and drama, you do it by rehearsals. Um, in, in sport, you do it by training. So it's exactly the same. If you're um, faced with what feels like quite a pressurised situation, um, you, you're quite likely to miss something or perhaps not give the answer in the way that you expected to give it. Um, and that might lead to questions which you don't really want to have to follow up on. So 
If you practice with your senior officers and you can be guided through that process so that um, you can think about what you're going to say, how you're going to say it, you can be corrected in a safe environment, that's something that would be really beneficial. So um, if everybody does the training, everybody has the same understanding, then you practice um, and you make sure that the answers that you give are in line with the um, answers that are expected, uh, then that's going to be a massive help. So what I'm going to uh, do now, um, sorry, I've just gone a little bit further forward than I should have done. I'm going to show you a video of a case study so that you can um, see what they're like. It takes about two and a half minutes and um, it, and we'll discuss the uh, what it, um, following the uh, following the case study. So here it comes. In this case study, the inspector will verify the use of electronic chart display and information systems, ECTIS, on board. The question that the inspector is asked to answer is, were the master and the navigating officers familiar with the company procedures for the setup and operation of the ECTIS unit? And were records available to show that ECTIS has been operated in accordance with them? The inspector will answer the question by asking the navigating officer to explain the use of the ECTIS on board. The inspector will be guided by the SIA 2.0 question library and will observe the navigating officer's response, as well as reviewing company-specific procedures and examining voyage records. During the inspection, the inspector notes that the navigating officer clearly understands the use of the ECTIS systems on board and is confident in their use. Recognizing how important ECTIS is for the safe navigation of the vessel, the inspector also notes that the navigating officer did not routinely verify the ECTIS settings or periodically record the outcome during the last voyage. Additionally, although the SMS listed options for verifying the ECTIS settings, it did not state the frequency or the preferred method. Looking at the drop-down list of observations, the inspector noted that PIFs 1, 3 and 8 were applicable and commented accordingly. PIF 1 was as expected. The navigation officer recognized the safety criticality of the task and took the appropriate actions. PIF 3 was not as expected. The procedures were not helpful and their requirements were open to interpretation and not understood by the navigating officer. PIF 8 was not as expected. The ECDIS could have been giving inaccurate information, leading to a false sense of security as the settings were not being periodically reviewed. In this case, a negative observation was raised. Right, let's go back to the presentation. Thank you, James. So, well, I, I hope you can see from that uh, little clip there that human factors is really nothing to be afraid of. Um, it's a clearly defined process. It's based around the performance influencing factors. And um, it will be very obvious to the inspector uh, which one applies. And um, uh, it, the, the, so that's in a way trying to remove any subjectivity that's re related to that. As has already been mentioned, the, the, the SIA 2.0 question library is an incredible resource. And um, whilst it's quite daunting, there are a number of ways uh, that you can uh, break it down into the, the sections that are um, applicable to each of your different departments. And by working through a certain number of them every week and every month, um, you'll soon have an idea um, of, of exactly what's expected of you during during the inspection. So the, the, the brilliant thing about it is, is that um, it provides a model answer because not only does it tell you what legislation is applicable um, and what TMSA element it applies to it, but it also gives you the um, evidence that the inspector is looking for and also the potential grounds for any negative observation. 
So, so in a way, you could say there's not really any excuse um, for getting it wrong because the model answer is is there. But of course, it does require effort. And the thing that um, the, the training modules uh, promote over and over again is really preparation, 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 and making sure that you've done everything that you can to show that you're um, performing to the highest standards. So, and clearly the more familiar that your uh, officers and your crew are with the inspection process and the more practice they have, um, the, the greater their confidence will be. And if they discover ways along the way um, by looking at their shipboard processes and procedures um, to improve things, um, then we'll have all achieved our goals as well of safer shipping and safer seas. So with that, I'd uh, like to thank you for your attention and hand you back to James. I think you're on mute, James. <laughs> Class. Um, I'm just going to hand you over now to Raul Harris, our very own Chief Creative Officer here at Ocean Technologies Group. So over to you, Raul. Yeah, thank, thanks, uh, James. And uh, and thanks to you, Andy, for, for outlining there the different um, modules and stuff that we have that cover different aspects of the, of the SIRE and giving a good indication of how to get on. Uh, I feel kind of something of a fraud next to Franz and Andy with a huge amounts of experience in saying because we might be wondering why I'm speaking. Um, my background is around 20 years of making maritime e-learning, listening to experts like these guys and I've worked with Andy in that capacity and also work in lots of industry groups as well, which is where I know um, friends from working together in, uh, in one of the intertanko groups. And um, so it's a great pleasure to be here with you today. And I'm going to keep my section very brief because time is ticking and I can see some questions already. Please load us up with some more questions. So I'll, I'll get through my piece as quickly as I can, and then we'll go to the questions and we'll hopefully be able to help you with anything extra that you'd like to know. So, James, you want to just load up my um, my deck. What I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and sort of zoom back a little bit and I'm going to try and give you some extra things to think about how you can kind of support the whole idea and the whole approach around, um, around human factors. So we start off, um, these documents have uh, been, been mentioned earlier, but really, what you're what you're seeing there is is an understanding from Ockinf, you know, that many of the safety barriers that have been put in place have helped us to reduce risk. And they've got some great graphs around that happening over time. But the one stubborn sort of piece that still remains is what we're talking around human factors. And I think it's really important that we dwell on the human factors as opposed to human element. There's a reason. I mean, it, they're, they're kind of interchanged sometimes. But I think the key thing about human factors is we're talking about things that may it may not just be a person making the wrong decision it could be things that are impinging on that so it could be procedures that are the, the issue there it could be the ergonomics of the space it could be things <coughs> like anything that affects the human human's ability to be able to perform as intended and these two documents um very very interesting if you haven't looked at them i suggest you look at them because they they really give an indication of sort of what's underpinning this whole approach so the first one there was that sort of understanding human factors approach second one um they're looking at at, at the whole uh, how you could go about assessing that and monitoring that obviously you can't manage what you can't measure so how do we assess it and all those sorts of things so first step is to look at those and what we see when we look at those is that there's this idea of the five pillars of, of successful human performance or that, that's going to lead to safe tanker operations. And there are many different dimensions to those. The one I want to sort of focus our attention on just today is that that sort of first leading pillar, if you like. And I think it's number one for a reason, which is leading and shaping the culture you want. And increasingly, I think across our industry, we're seeing that understanding that the culture is really, really important, a foundational piece to getting everything else um, right. You may have heard this well-worn phrase, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, the other one that's slightly more telling perhaps is, is people saying culture is what happens when the boss isn't around, you know, or when no one is looking, they say. And, and that's really kind of, I think, key to understanding how to be successful um, with SIA. When people start judging your human factors, you're getting people much more face time with the people in your organization. And so it's, you know, you can try and put in all sorts of rules and everything for them to follow. But getting the culture right means that they're making better decisions and they're presenting themselves in the right way and saying the right things without you necessarily having to guide them. So I think that's a really key thing. 
So how can you go about kind of underpinning that and making sure that that's uh, there? And I think this quote, which which I saw in, I'll come to talk about it a little bit more, but the BCAV document or behavioral competency assessment, this quote, competency frameworks offer a structured approach to managing, appraising, and improving important um, performance by reinforcing values and encouraging a common culture. That comes straight out of the document, linked through to that pillars there, this is for me competency management and how you go about it is really really crucial and this gives you uh, a way of managing measuring improving um, that core foundational piece there and getting that right um, talking about competency frameworks i just want to spotlight these two there are many we have lots and lots and lots of different ones i want to focus on these ones and uh, not least because franz is here today with us this morning but the uh, the Intertanko Competency Management Guidelines and, of course, Behavioural uh, Competency, BCAV that I mentioned, um, which was done in, in tandem with, with, with OCINF. And why? Because on the one hand, the ICMG is dealing with technical skills and the BCAV is dealing with behavioural competencies. But, of course, the two things uh, exist together. No one is being assessed independently of a task. Um, and the task themselves, ability to be a performant in a task, is also going to have a lot of human factors and a lot of things going on within that that are to do with communication, leadership, you know, all those sorts of um, really good things. So I think these are two areas that you can focus on uh, that are manageable starts to, to, to getting hold of competency and just starting to make it measurable. Um, I won't labor the point about competency management systems because they've been around a long time. But one of the things that I think is often un un overlooked in competency management is that the process, if you get it right, is encouraging uh, some of those communications and mentoring and sort of person to person interaction that is really important to, to um, successful human performance. And so um, to give you some idea of why I say that, you know, People manage competence in all sorts of different ways. One of the things that I think is I'm passionate about a digital competency management is that it's managing that process. It's facilitating that process. And this is just one example here in the assessment workflow that you can see how complex this potentially is because you've got the person who has to do their background preparation for the task that they're going to do and understand, you know, uh, to Andy's point. You know, what is it that they're actually what is the model answer effectively? What do people want to see from them? Um, and then it needs to be assessed. So the digital uh, process allows you to do that handover between the person wanting to be assessed, the assessor, moving backwards, forwards, the assessment itself, tracking that, tracking the evaluation and updating that record so that we can actually see at, uh, at back at the uh, shore office. We can actually see that picture of what's happening in our organization, not just sort of training data uh, of who's done what module, but a little bit deeper than that still and looking at some of these specific things. Um, next point around the grading of assessments. And I think this is a big change when we come to particularly behavioral competencies um, is we're then looking at, you know, how do you say, can you say someone is can, can communicate? Yes or no. It's not really that binary, right? There are grades to it. There are things that you might want to see. So we might say when we come to assess it, instead of it being pass or fail, we might decide that there's a grading system of how well they communicate. Or we might say that we break communication down into two or three different categories. They displayed listening skills, they displayed communication skills. So being able to grade your assessments in that way and collect more information that gives you a much richer picture of where your people are actually at is, is really crucial um, within that. And then this is a really key point. We're asking people to do a lot when we come to say, assess uh, assess um, human factors, assess behavioral competency. You know, we see that that's gonna be a challenge for, for the uh, SIRE inspectors themselves to be able to get their heads around that. They've been doing huge amounts of preparation to prepare for that. Um, it's not an easy thing to do to assess someone's behavioral competency. And so we have to help the, the, the people on board if you're going down this road, road, of, road of, um, of trying to assess and trying to see where you are with behavioral competency. So a, a couple of uh, things that we can add into the mix there that, that, that we provide as well. So an actual introduction to behavioral competency. I think that's really, really important um, that they understand what that is and how that works to be able to get a start on that. And then in the BCAB document itself, it also cites the um, the, the model course, uh, the, the IMO model course, 
um, for the uh, trainer and assessor. So that's another sort of, I would say, foundational piece to understand assessment more generally and how to go about um, that process. Now, um, another dimension that was was being able to practice through and, and Andy was talking about that, you know, doing role play and stuff like that, which I, I'm a big fan of. I think that works really, really well. Um, but this is a, another fun asset that we're that we're um, adding into the library as well. It's not something we've made. It's something that we saw from a, an enterprising company called NavGuide Solutions. It produced some uh, SIA material of their own. And this is one of the things that, that I quite like that they do there that kind of allows you to sort of play through a scenario. Um, and it's uh, of a conversation um, with the inspector and, and, and kind of help people to understand, you know, what it is that the inspector is looking for from answers and stuff like that. So this is a good example of where we take we, we produce stuff all the time for our own library. But we're also on, always on the lookout for good additional material that we can use and we can, um, uh, you know, help to offer our customers as well. So they've got it all in one place. Last thing I would say is, as well, there's a lot of stuff in there in that human factors document about the feedback, let's say, you know, that ability to actually see what's going on um, within your organization to actually move that remove those those blind spots, you know, have people really understood what it is they're doing, how are they feeling about the work they're doing, how are they approaching it, all those sorts of things. And so I think it's really you can see a quote there I won't, in the interest of time, I won't read through it. But I think thinking about how you build that in to, to things is really important. And the approach we've taken there is to build something called Pulse Surveys into our learning system. So we're actually able to collate that data and sort of make that a bit of a symbiotic process. So we will run surveys at the end of the training material itself, which is about, you know, did they enjoy the content, that sort of thing. But this is more broadly allows you to actually sort of say, you know, how are you feeling about the work you're doing um, so that you can start to get a, a sense of where your people are at. So. That's pretty much everything I wanted to cover. Um, so I guess we've got time for some questions now. James, you want to just remind people how they can input questions? Yes, absolutely, Ralph. Well. <clears throat> Thank you for that. So yes, there's a, a box on the right-hand side uh, labeled chat. If you do have any questions, please put them in there. We've had quite a lot actually now. Thanks, since your prompt. Thanks, Ralph. So I'm going to run through these in chronological order. Um, as I mentioned at the start, if we do run out of time for these, we will contact you afterwards with an answer. So I think looking at these, the majority of them are going to be over to you, Franz, to answer um, some of these. So going with the first ones that we've had, um, when is phase three going to be kicked off? So when is phase three likely to begin? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, like I said, we are now in phase two. Um, after phase two, once uh, OKIMF and, and their members uh, said we have now uh, enough information, uh, IT worked fine, the tablets are working fine, uh, uploads on their system is working fine, they start to evaluate and then uh, they will evaluate that. Uh, if there are some hiccups, they have to repair them. Um, and then they will inform the industry timely. That's what they said. They will inform us time. I haven't seen, like I said, watch the space. Um, tanker operators have a uh, um, an account. <clears throat> sorry, an account on OKIMF website. Enter tanker members. Watch the weekly news articles. As soon as we have news, we will release it. But obviously, um, you'll need time to upload the PIQ, to arrange an inspection, to upload photographs, etc. And this OKIM realizes, so they will give you time for that. It is not like, uh, let's start tomorrow. They will give a couple of weeks for sure, uh, if not uh, at least a month, that you'll have the chance to, uh, to arrange the phase three inspections. Okay, thank you. Um, in your presentation, you mentioned that SIA 2.0 will come into force because the old one takes too much time due to the huge number of questions. Uh, do you have a feel for the amount of time um, for a SIA 2.0 inspection? Of course, it depends on the current situation of the vessel, but do you have a, a rough answer you're able to provide? Uh, that's very clear uh, guidance, uh, James, from, uh, from OKINF that it will remain 8 to 10 hours. Um, but um, so eight to ten hours on board. 
-hmm. Obviously, um, the inspectors will need some more time beforehand mm -hmm. to verify the uh, the PIQ data, the photographs, um, uh, the the certificates, uh, all these kind of things. They will do that before they step on board. But the time on board remains, say, eight hours. Okay. So much, much more time um, to engage with the people on board than going through documentation. Great. Thanks, Franz. Um, what are the main differences between SIA and SIA 2.0? It's a game changer, okay? Um, the SIA was, uh, was very yes, no, not applicable. Uh, now there are the grades uh, in, in, in most of the questions. Um, there will be much more interaction between the crew and the inspector himself. Uh, it's, it's a complete different mindset. Okay, thank you. Um, under SIAP 2.0, what does a positive observation typically entail? All right, very, very interesting question. Um, a positive observation, first of all, can only be made on the uh, under the human factor, um, on under the human uh, uh, observation. So not on uh, on the uh, hardware process. So human. Um, keep that in mind. Um, it will say um, the junior officer exceeded normal expectations. Yeah. And here again, um, mandatory by the by default, the inspector must um, indicate one of the performance indicating factors, the one of the PIFs, like uh, and 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 he mentions the the PIFs. Um, so for a positive observation exceeding normal expectations, that's that will be the standard wording, and he will be able to, uh, he must first of all uh, indicate one of the PIFs and eventually give uh, give some some commands on that one. That's that's typical positive observation. Could I um, cut in on on that? Because there's another question just looking through them there. There's there's one there sort of about the PIFs and it's sort of saying there's nothing on any of your papers or websites. And there's no, basically sort of saying there's no guidance on the PIFs. But actually, you know, I think there's quite a lot of guidance on there. I think maybe we just need to connect you to the right information. I believe some of the videos that Occupy have made um, cover that. I think, do, Franz, yes. you might have a comment. And Andy, our, our training package, there's, uh, is either one actually on the PIFs or covers the PIFs? Yes, so the Human Factors module the human covers factors the module. PIFs in detail. And it, yeah. and it also reiterates that point there about um, positive ob observations as well, because, um, yes, it is, it is quite possible that, you know, um, navigating officer as demonstrating knowledge that the um, inspector would expect from the captain um, and in that way he, you know it would be very straightforward for him to say well yes you know this this guy is really performing well and to give credit uh, where where credit's due so that's a significant change as well trying to move away from this sort of very negative approach mm -hmm. and it and it is exactly in that human factors area um, which, as Franz yeah. has already said, is 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 the area that's going to make the biggest impact on safety, where that um, the performance influencing factors um, really come into play. So um, yes, there can be things around hardware as well, but but mainly it's around the actual um, human behaviour that uh, will will really lead to the biggest change with SAR two point zero. Yeah, Franz, did you want to say anything more about that? Because there is there is quite a lot of guidance available. There, there, it is there. Yeah, you are absolutely right, uh, Raul. It is uh, on 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 Okinf website. There is a lot of uh, documentation available on the PIFs, and it's detailed over there also. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Okay. I've um, <clears throat> got a few more questions in here. We've got about five minutes left, so we'll try and get through as many of these as we can. Um, can we challenge a SIRE inspector if a given observation is not appropriate due to a different background of the inspector? Um, I yeah, I mean, I, I, I can jump in ahead of Franz. <laughs> I think that's something, certainly we describe that in the, um, the, the uh, OTG modules. Uh, yes, if you think the inspector is wrong, um, then please do challenge him because yeah. Um, 
yeah, they do come from different backgrounds. They do have some ideas of their own about what things should be required. And whilst it's very clear guidance written down in the each of the questions about what um, what's to be expected, um, they can they can sometimes make their own interpretations. And if it doesn't fit, um, it's possible that, for example, that they haven't kept up to date with legislation. That something something has changed and it's a different requirement now. Then you know, be sure to challenge them. And uh, there's there's no there's no um, nothing negative about that at all. It's it's a very positive thing to do. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I've got a, a question that's coming here. Since the quality of SIRE inspections are improving the SIRE 2.0 implementation, is there any ideas or thoughts um, around reducing the number of inspections, like once in a year or based on the results of latest inspections? Because um, the feeling, the thought is that ships are overloaded with inspections, CDI, SIA, PSC, flag, class, and preparation for all of them is not such an easy task. Um, actually, a great question from from my perspective. Um, when I was sailing uh, many years ago, um, I had an inspection in every port. And then came Sire, where um, the uh, the old majors said, "Let's let's go for one inspection," uh, and we all agree on the format uh, 93, I think. Um, and um, at that time, I think it was from uh, like for one year it is available. And then one old major said, "Ah, one year is too long. Let's make it six months." And everybody followed. Everybody said, oh, yes, yeah, six months is a good idea. Um, we think with the data, let's start to let Okim roll out the SIA 2 first. But we think indeed that the all majors will have so much data from your ship, from how you are performing, from how your crew is performing, that in the long run, uh, this... Um, this focus on six months will maybe be relaxed for the good performers. Yeah, those who exceed normal expectations from all majors, why not indeed say, we do not need every six months on this ship or this operator ships. Um, we will be happy to, uh, to do it after eight months or 10 months or but let's let's roll it out first. Let let them roll it out first. Uh, let them gather the data because data from SIA two, they will need time to gather all this data, um, and hopefully it will be useful for the whole industry. This data, um, but yes, that's how I see it also. Yeah, that in the long run uh, we will not be focused on the six month anymore. Sorry for the long answer. Hi, <laughs> no, that's great. Thank you. <laughs> Um, okay. Well, actually, it's quite amazing how, how many questions you're actually getting, friends. I think you're going to be quite busy after. Whereas, I mean, they're very technical questions, and I don't think we're going to have time to to go through them this morning. But as James said, we will make sure yes. that we get an answer to everybody. Yeah, yeah sure. I will make yeah. sure that uh, I, I yeah. give you the feedback. Mm -hmm. yeah. We can group. I think I can see that some of them we can sort of group together as well. There's similar themes. A lot of it's around. Um, you know specific timetables, which of course I think you would have given if you if you could. Sure, sure. Um, but of course we can give you know we can give you uh, the, the best guess I suppose is that is, is all we can do. But um, but as you've seen, my observation with with Sire with watching this for well since 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 inception and started talking about it is you know it, it's moved around a lot and they are taking a very uh, the reason for the phases is to make sure we get it right and to make sure that it, it, it if they unearth things that they didn't maybe think about some unintended consequences that there's time in that session right to go back and change it and that's why it's quite challenging for us to sort of you know go too heavy on too specific on 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 individual pieces of guidance and 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 you know think i'm, I'm guessing as well friends that with the seafarers guide there's got to be a bit of a lag there as well in that you know you, there's a question there about when when it's going to be the release of that but i mean i know it's written largely but there's still is it still room for maneuver in that or do you think that's pretty much nailed down now uh that's uh it's uh in the second proofread and uh it's it's done basically yeah good good yeah. 
Um, but there was another question about, you know, are we uh, making training modules on specific questions within the, you know, the VIQ? I think the issue there is that there's huge numbers of them. And of course, it's going to change dramatically uh, at, at a kind of vessel level and what's happening within the company and stuff like that. So we don't plan to go that, to go that granular with it. It's more sort of broader support for, for things. Yeah. Um, so we've hit the top of the hour. I can't see any easy questions for us to... <laughs> To deal with but as i said we will we will analyze them and we'll get back to you um but yeah james just want to wrap us up yeah so thank you very much everybody for <clears throat> for joining us today hope you found the information useful um yeah just want to reiterate Raoul's point we will get back in touch with everybody who's asked a question with a response um just one thing to finish off with um what's next some of you may would have joined us for previous webinars that we've been running um we have another one in a few weeks time which is about the um rapid e-learning functionality that we have we'll do a, a live demo on that of how to actually build a course um and as near to five minutes as is humanly possible um and also for anybody who's joined us um from singapore or in the region we have a customer seminar there on november the 16th some of the topics that we'll cover with a, an expert panel of industry speakers covered the likes of human factors in our evolving industry unlocking your greatest asset which is your workforce leaders building leaders so there'll be some fascinating presentations interesting panel discussions lots of networking opportunities with a drinks reception so we will send out um in more detailed information about that very shortly but if you are in the area and are able to join us on that date it's perhaps worth just bookmarking that in your diary but aside from that like i said sorry Raul, did you want to yeah just you know just want to say you know james has been putting these together for us you know we've been um getting the webinars going again um did a lot of them in COVID times and and then sort of, you know, they, they went away. But we found that there's a very good ways of us getting uh, direct contact with you guys. So we really liked and appreciate you coming. I really want to thank Franz for taking his time to come and join us today. It's a really valued uh, input there. So thank you so much. And and Andy, for all the, the, the care and attention you've been putting into our library, making sure it's up to date and everything. But, yeah, just wanted to my final point is, you know, please do feedback to us tell us what you like tell us what you don't like surveys go out i know it's boring but when you fill them in it really helps us to improve because we can then focus more time on the things that that you like and that sort of stuff so please keep in touch thanks for spending time with us this morning and good luck out there <laughs> thank, thank you. you thank you thanks, bye everybody